Welcome back, everyone. It is really my great pleasure to introduce the first keynote of our summer school by Professor Don Ingmer. Don is the founding director of the WIS Institute for Biologically Inspired Engineering at Harvard University, the Judah Folkman Professor of Vascular Biology at Harvard Medical School, and the Vascular Biology Program at Boston Children's Hospital. He's also the Jans Kork, Jan, Hans Jörg Wyss Professor of Bioinspired Engineering at the Harvard um, John Paulson School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. Don is a pioneer in the field of biologically inspired engineering. And at the Wyss Institute, he currently leads scientific and engineering teams that cross a broad range of disciplines to develop breakthrough inspired bioinspired technologies to advance healthcare and to improve sustainability. His work has led to numerous advances in mechanobiology, cell structure, tumor, tumor angiogenesis, tissue engineering, system biology, nanobiotechnology, and translational medicine. His work has not only crossed boundaries between engineering, medicine, and bioscience, but also between science, art, and design. And it was really my great pleasure to meet Don uh, one year and a half ago at a conference in Munich. And I thought his talk there was absolutely inspiring and blew my mind. And I was delighted when he accepted to be um, the starting keynote for the summer school today, because I think he epitomizes what we all aspire to really do interdisciplinary research that is really breakthrough and changes the world for the better. Thank you so much, Don, for making the time to give this keynote today. Well, thank, thank you uh, very much. Eva. I'm going to share my screen here. Let's make sure this works. Can you? Uh, can you all see my screen? Yeah, that looks good. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, so, uh, I'm. You know, I, my talk is going to be lots of uh, biology with some early examples of AI ML applications. But my goal today is really to describe to you some of the innovative experimental models that we've been developing. That I think are indicative of what's out there that you may not be aware of um, that can be integrated with artificial intelligence to accelerate drug development and really transform healthcare, I think. Um, so uh, as you heard, I, I founded the Wies Institute about 15 years ago, and um, we were kicked off with what was then the, the largest single philanthropic gift in Harvard's history. And we were supposed to take on uh, really high risk, but potentially high impact challenges. And the, the biggest problem that I could see at the time was that the drug development is, is really broken even more than challenged. Um, uh, most drugs that are developed fail when they get to clinical trials and they cost a huge amount, as you can see here, over $3 billion to go from lab bench to approval. There are many reasons for this, but a major one is that I, I, FDA has required in the past that you have to do animal studies, which take years to complete major ethical issues, especially with non-human primates. But the real problem is that, um, you know, mice are not men. And over, on average, 70% of the time, the results from these animal studies are wrong when it comes to clinical trials. And in some areas, it's over 95%. So there's been a, a, a search over the years for, um, or alternatives that would allow us to develop safer and more effective drugs fast, faster and at, at lower cost. And so when we started the Institute, um, we had about five major platform areas. And I started one myself that is essentially focused on developing what has been now known as human organs on chips. And the idea here is to leverage microchip manufacturing techniques where you have control over features at the same nanometer to micrometer scale that cells and tissues live at, and to create microchips containing living human cells that reconstitute organ level functions, not cell or tissue, but organ level functions to accelerate drug development, replace animal testing, and also advance personalized medicine. I think AI machine learning, that's going to 
really be a hot area in the future. Now, our first breakthrough came in 2010, where we developed what we call the human breathing lung on a chip. And I want to emphasize, we're not trying to build a whole organ here. I like to think of these as living three-dimensional cross-sections through a major functional unit of an organ. And in the first study, we started the lung alveolus or air sac. And, you know, this is where you have gas exchange, uh, drug delivery, uh, pneumonia, COVID, et cetera, um, major functional unit. And, you know, I, I think most of you are familiar. For those who are not, the alveolus is a relatively simple structure that's filled with air. If you go to the electron microscopic level, um, there's air in the cross section. You see an, an alveolar epithelial cell, the lung lining cell, a flexible porous extracellular matrix, the basement membrane, and then the opposite side is a capillary blood vessel cell, and then blood. But what it doesn't show you is that this is an incredibly mechanically active structure when you breathe in and out, stretches and relaxes. And my entire career, starting 45 years ago, has pursued the idea that mechanical forces are as important as chemicals and genes for development and, and, and physiology, as in pathophysiology, and is certainly known to be true in the lung. So if you were trying to distill down, like, what are the minimal design principles uh, of an organ? It's really two or more different types of tissue tissues that come together, usually interface, and new functions emerge, of which one is almost always a blood vessel. Uh, and, and the other features that we felt were important was to have these physiological, mechanical motions, breathing motions, blood flow, uh, and so forth. And so it, at, at the VEAS Institute, we say what we want to do is leverage biological principles to develop new engineering innovations. And that's what we're essentially doing here. So we want a tissue tissue interfaces, dynamic flow of air and fluids, and also cyclic breathing motions. The next video shows you how the chip works. It's, it's the size of a computer memory stick as shown at the top right, made out of optically clear flexible silicon rubber. We use microchip manufacturing to engineer three hollow channels, each less than a millimeter wide. The middle channel is cut in the top and bottom by the same rubber membrane with pores in it we coat this with extracellular matrix. We then put human lung alveolar cells on top, human lung capillary at the bottom. We just created, recreated the alveolar capillary interface. Then we apply cyclic suction or vacuum to the side channels. It's flexible, so they stretch and relax at the same rate and degree as we breathe in and out. We then can put air over the top, create an air-liquid interface. We could put flowing medium with or without immune cells to mimic blood. And if we put endothelial cells on all four sides, we could even put whole blood without anticoagulants for hours. Now, if this were to work, it should mimic an organ level response. So imagine if you have a bacterial infection, there's usually a tissue-tissue signaling response. Cytokines are put out by the epithelium. They activate the endothelium. White blood cells that were just flowing by now stick, roll, and migrate across and engulf the bacterium. That's homeostasis. Now, you're going to see images next are fluorescent microscopic images in the device. These cells are fresh white blood cells. We know they're fresh. We took them out of my postdoc, labeled fluorescently. You don't see the endothelium. They're unlabeled, and the epithelium is behind the screen. To begin with, quiescent vessel, they just flow by. Now we had bacteria on the other side. Now you get cytokines, ICAM-1 is expressed and the immune cells are pulled out under flow. And this is important because the first step is shear stress dependent, that initial adhesion. Now you could do higher magnification, any imaging you could do in vitro or in vivo, you do in these devices. That's one immune cell just went through endothelial cell barrier through the matrix filled pentagonal pore, goes out of focus. Now you're gonna see it come out the other side by phase contrast. Now I'm gonna show you the white blood cells in red because I'm gonna, the bacteria are labeled in green with GFP. And you watch them being in gold. So you just watch the entire human inflammatory response in this little rubber ship. That got the interest. I, I, people at the FDA and NIH said that when that paper came out, that they realized this is feasible. And it's really changed people's thinking over the last 15 years. So it's that there's billions invested in this war area around the world at this point. And this one chip, this long alveolus chip, we were able to demonstrate proof of principle for disease models. We used to develop models of pulmonary edema, 
uh, drug toxicity models, even when not seen in animals, drug efficacy, we've discovered new therapeutic targets. Um, one of the drugs in phase two clinical trials, we did gene therapy in adenoviral vector delivery. It's won in numerous awards, including being honored, being honored by the World Economic Forum. It won the International Design Award, beating out the Google car one year. And uh, I'm always proud that it's in the Museum of Modern Art's permanent design collection, which is pretty amazing. Um, we've integrated immune cells, as I showed you in that movie. We also integrate stromal cells, look at, for example, pulmonary fibrosis, and we're beginning to integrate neuronal cells. So you, this is synthetic biology at the cell tissue and organ level. You can add increased complexity as you need it. Sometimes you learn that our assumptions about needing complex things are wrong, and you can mimic a human clinical response with the simple system, and you learn you don't need these other cells. But if it's if you can't mimic it, something's missing, then you add it back. So you, and you can control each parameter individually, so you can actually get mechanistic insight in ways you couldn't with any other model. So uh, we then talked to pharmaceutical companies. They liked this, but they said, we're interested in uh, diseases like asthma and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, because that's where there's more need for therapeutics. And those are diseases of the small airway, not the alveolus. So we then developed an airway model. These are bronchial epithelial cells on one side, endothelial cells on the other. They differentiate, as you can see, beautiful cilia. They move in a directional way. This is on the chip. At the bottom right, uh, they what you see are little fluorescent particles moving in the mucus, and they moving mucociliary, mucociliary clearance rate is exactly the same as in our lungs at this very moment. We then made chips with cells from patients with diseases, in this case, primary cells from patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD. Now, after three weeks under an aeroliquid interface, which is what it takes to differentiate them on these chips, uh, amazingly, no immune cells, they retain the COPD phenotype in terms of decreased expression of TOL3 and 4, TOL R3 and 4 receptors. And what brings COPD patients to the emergency room, for the clinicians in the crowd know this, that it's usually exacerbations by bacterial infection, viral infection, or cigarette smoke. And so we started in these early studies uh, mimicking viral infection with poly IC and bacterial infection with LPS endotoxin. And you can see that we don't see any big effects on IL-8 secretion, major inflammatory cytokine or MCSF in the healthy, but the COPD respond uh, significantly to, to, to um, IL-8 with the bacterial infection and MCSF with viral infection, which could give insight into new biomarkers actually as well. Now, we then made a cigarette smoking robot because we could kind of build anything at the Beast Institute. This is a Gatling gun with real cigarettes. That's a cigarette lighter from a car. The smoke, we can mimic smoking parameters, pauses, pulses, puffs, and the real smoke goes to the airspace of the chip, not cigarette extract like has been done in the past. And this is just one result. Um, on the left is major inflammatory cytokine IL-8. Smoke in a healthy chip didn't really stimulate inflammation, but smoke in a COPD chip doubled IL-8 levels. At the right, you see transcriptomic results. The, the three lanes on the right are three different patient chips, changes in gene expression after exposure to cigarette smoke. The nine at the left are from a clinical study with healthy patients who smoke cigarettes. Um, and as you can see, the top quarter versus bottom three quarters in terms of up and down looks pretty good. We were very excited. The reviewers said, yeah, but, you know, look at all your three patients are this very similar and there's so much more variance in the patients in the study. And then we realized that we could do this type of clinical study better than the clinical study because this is matched comparative modeling of the same patient before and after cigarette smoke. So those gene changes are actually related to smoke. Where the ones on the left, some are clearly related to smoking, but others are you know, family history, work environment, home environment, et cetera. And, and we eventually got this in and were asked to do a mini review on matched comparative modeling in vitro. Um, we also recently were asked by the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, could we build a cystic fibrosis chip? So we got cells from CF patients. And as you can see, this is the whole length of the chip. 
staining for cilia in green, and there are just many more cilia in the CF chip, which is known to be true in these patients. Look at beating frequency, it's significantly higher on the chip in CF, also known in patients. But if we do the same cells in the same medium under static conditions on a trans well, we see the opposite. On the chips, you see increased mucus in CF, just like in patients. We see increased baseline inflammatory state, uh, and um, we see increased inflammatory cytokines. And we could even start to study microbiome because we have flow. We can, in this case, we grow Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Now, Pseudomonas is in all of our lungs, and we, we're fine. But CF patients, you get rampant overgrowth, major cause for morbidity and mortality. You see rampant overgrowth on these chips as well. Now, I show you this because what this suggests is that these organ chips provide a window, literally a visual window, on molecular scale activities inside living cells within a relevant tissue and organ context. And what this means is that this could enable new mechanistic insights and drug discovery, and at the same time, provide a human relevant way to experimentally test predictions, so a preclinical human model rather than preclinical animal model. Now, uh, we've gone on to uh, do many other things. So I, I've worked in cancer since 1978 was my first publication. And in the 70s and 80s, the big leap in cancer research was to go from injecting tumors subcutaneously, where they look nothing like in human, to developing orthotopic models where you might put a prostate tumor in the prostate gland or a mammary tumor in the mammary fat pad. And they look a little bit more like they do in humans. So we had these human microenvironments, so we decided to develop human orthotopic cancer chips. We started with lung. I showed you we had a lung alveolus chip and a lung airway chip. But we used a cell line, a cancer cell called H1975, which is a non-small cell lung cancer, but it's an adenocarcinoma form that in patients emerges in the distant airway, the bronchial, but it almost always grows in the alveoli and, and causes morbidity and mortality. And so what we did is we plated the cells the same time we plated the epithelium, but at low density, and then we watched them grow over time. The cancer cells are lab labeled in GFP. You can watch them grow and even invade. But at the right, you can see the growth curves. And the first thing I wanna show you is that these cells have been grown for 50 years in plastic dishes, serum containing medium, they grow very rapidly. That's the gray circles. If you, we use a special medium in our chips because we only feed through the vascular channel, there's air above. When we use the medium that we use in our chips in plastic dishes with these tumor cells, they don't grow virtually at all. So all the growth I'm going to talk about is microenvironment dependent, just like in our bodies. So on the small airway chip, if you plate them at low density early on, they're, they're, they're basically dormant until about nine days, 10 days, and then they start growing slowly. I should say that if we, the airway is, is thick enough that we can take a needle and inject the tumor cells after it's differentiated. When we do that, we get dormant tumors, just like in impatience where you see low growth in the small area. When we do this on the alveolus ship, they start growing immediately and you get rampant growth. But what was even more interesting which is again like in vivo. But what's more interesting is we did this with or without breathing motions. Breathing suppressed proliferation by 50% of the tumor. We, look, we could easily measure invasion with GFP tumor cells going through those pores. Breathing inhibited invasion by 50%. And I, I basically, we went on showing that breathing affects response to first line cancer drugs like rosalitinib, the tyrosine kinase inhibitor, if there's no breathing, rampant tumor growth, you, you just stop tumor growth, it flattens. With breathing, it grows slowly, but right through it. And we could we actually could show mechanistically that the breathing is regulating EGFR tyrosine phosphorylation, which is a major target for this drug. We then started to develop models of viral infection. Both DARPA and NIH came to us in, 19, in 2017 2017, before COVID, because they were worried about potential respiratory pandemic viruses, but the focus was on influenza at that time. So we took our airway chip, and this is GFP H1N1 influenza. You could watch infection in real time. It's a beautiful model. You can see the breakdown of the epithelium with 
cell cell junctions, loss of cilia, even endothelial damage. You could show strain dependence. We're measuring H1N1, H3N2, H5N1, different virulence on chip, just scales with what you see in patients, including cytokines. You could look at comorbidity, like in a clinical trial, which you can't do in animal studies. If you look at healthy patients versus COPD who are known to be much more sensitive to influenza, you get a tenfold higher viral titer in the COPD patients with the same viruses. And now you can measure essentially cytokine storm. You can look at the cytokines in the vascular channel, systemic distribution, if you like, and it scales again with the virulence of these different types of viruses. You could watch the immune cell recruitment, even clearance of cells that are infected with virus at the bottom left. And finally, you could look at drug effects. So also Tamivir is Tamiflu, the, the leading drug for influenza. Um, What's amazing is not only do you see potent inhibition on chip, but the FDA only approves this drug for the first 48 hours after infection. And on the chip, it's only active for the first 48 hours after infection. Finally, we've even explored evolution of spontaneous variants of concern, if you like. We took a chip, infected it with virus. We added a drug at 90% efficacy dose. We incubate for a couple of days, then we take a droplet of fluid through the airspace and if you and pass it to another chip's airspace, almost like you're coughing from one person to another. And we did this repeatedly in the continuous presence of drug at 90% efficiency. With a, a, an older can, uh, anti-influenza drug, amantadine, um, in eight passages, you get completely resistant viruses. We did gene sequencing and we identified a number of mutations. We found all the mutations that have been reported clinically in patients who spontaneously became uh, resistant to this drug. But we also identified a number of new mutations never seen before. So now you have the possibility of identifying what mutations may be coming out in the future, which could impact drug and vaccine development years ahead. We also did this with Tamiflu, took 25 passages, but we got resistant virus, which is kind of terrifying. And this is when COVID-19 hit, 2020, January. And I had two postdocs who had just arrived, virologists from China, who were following this on social media. And the day after the science paper came out, January 12th, with the, the viral sequence, they ordered pseudotype viruses expressing the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein that we could use in our BSL-2 lab, uh, because we don't have a BSL-3 lab. Um, <coughs> I would also were able to get funding from DARPA because of the prior work we had done, that leveraging two different computational approaches, which use machine learning um, for rapid drug repurposing was the, the idea. Quickly, can we find drugs that might work? One of these uh, approaches uses molecular dynamic simulation, so rational drug design with machine learning computationally generating structures based on chemoinformatic data and iteratively modeling and, and using ML to go through possible structures and then medicinal chemistry. The other uses a, uh, a network analysis pipeline, uses Bayesian analysis, but also has a machine learning component called NEMOCAD that we developed internally that uses transcriptomic data from patients or experimental studies or organs on chips um, and comes up with predictions for existing drugs. And then the idea was that we would test this in vitro assays, organ chips, do pharmacokinetics in an animal model hamster and then use hamster CoV-2 models. Now, the first thing is that we just started to screen drugs before we got the DARPA grant. My postdocs from China started to screen drugs that they tested 30 drugs that previously had shown activity against SARS-CoV-1, the first the SARS-CoV, or other coronaviruses. And they did it in the classic in vitro study, 2D dish using cells that are used by virologists, which have, by the way, low, low interferon levels, which is why viruses grow well. And out of those 30 drugs, um, eight showed dose-dependent inhibition of SARS-CoV-2 entry in the low micromolar range, including, and this is February, 2020, hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine. But then we tested them in our organs on chips where we're delivering 
we're flowing the drugs through, we're using a clinically relevant dose rather than bathing them for days, use this clinical CMAX. And now hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine have no, no effect at all, just as was confirmed later in animals and, and humans. Um, but we found a related drug, amodiaquine, used as malarial, anti-malarial prophylaxis in Africa for 50 years, very cheap, um, showed some activity, significant activity. And long story short on this, we tested it in this hamster model and we got potent suppression, uh, both in a prophylaxis mode and in a treatment mode. And that drug moved to over 20 sites in clinical trials in Africa. I should say it moved to clinical trials a year before the paper came out because our publication system is so broken. Um, now, using the molecular dynamic simulation approach, we targeted the conserved regions in the spike protein um, that are necessary for it to open up and merge with the membrane. And doing that, we were able to find an existing drug that would be predicted to bind that region, even though it's a tyrosine kinase, a, a kinase inhibitor. And um, we can show inhibition in our organ chips. But we've gone on using this molecular dynamic simulation with machine learning and designing new compounds, compounds that lacked its known kinase inhibition activity, and they are potent inhibitors of multiple coronaviruses, including SARS-CoV-2, SARS-CoV-1, MERS. Um, they in inhibit, you know, in the micro nanomolar range, and they also inhibit influenza because it's a conserved region that's also in hemagglutinin. So um, that's one example of computational site. The other is this NEMOCAD approach. So this one I'll take a minute to talk about. So uh, what we do here is we take gene expression profiles in this study. In this case, we took clinical data, transcriptomic data sets from healthy and COPD and COVID-2 patients. We then use uh, Bayesian networks and um, machine learning to basically say across 30,000 genes, what genes need to be flipped to go from disease to normal. And we could use this for any disease process. We, we have, we incorporate uh, from databanks, the links and others you see here, um, gene gene networks, as well as drug gene network information. So we could basically counterpoint, you know, which genes need to be changed? What are the gene gene network relationships? Which drugs are most likely to mimic that and those gene gene networks and get a priority, priority list? And one thing that came out during the COVID studies was that we got a number of statins in one of the most highly prescribed drugs in the world, um, and but not all statins. So it, 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 this is a repurposing where it looked like there's some other activity unrelated to the lipid metabolism side. Um, and importantly, we could confirm there were even some direct effects in vitro on SARS-CoV-2 infection by these statins. So that it did seem to have some other mechanisms. But more importantly, we recently published with a group in, at Stanford, um, they had data sets from 4,000 patients at Stanford. And we actually could confirm that uh, some statins, but not others, give you a significant reduction in, um, in mortality and, and morbidity uh, of COVID. Uh, so this is an example of um, AI machine learning really having a, quite, a, quite a power. Now, I'm going to continue on with the COVID story because uh, just to show you the power of these models, we also um, developed, uh, we also did a model of influenza where we were studying the alveolus chip. And here we made this strange observation that just like with cancer, breathing motions physiological breathing motions suppressed viral infection significantly in terms of viral titer and inflammatory response. And we uh, could show with uh, RNA-seq transcriptomic analysis, what we found is that physiological breathing activates innate immunity, the type one interferons. And um, when we did the RNA-seq, we did the volcano plot, what we found is there was one protein called S100A7 that was way up that seemed to scale with this breathing response. And this is a, 
a ligand that, that binds rage, which is the receptor for advanced glycation end products, which is most highly expressed in lung alveolar cells, but it's also a major mediator of inflammation in many organs. And uh, we found an existing drug, drug known as Zilorigan, which is a rage inhibitor drug, which has gone through phase three clinical trials for Alzheimer's because of the inflammatory component with 3000 patients, oral drug, very safe. Unfortunately missed its mark for Alzheimer's, which is a tough one, but we tested it in our chips and we completely inhibit the cytokine storm, which is exactly what is the, the, the lethal part of COVID for most people. And as a result, these data are actually included in an investigational new drug application to the FDA submitted by the company Cantex Pharma that owns the drug uh, to initiate COVID trials. We also discovered entirely new therapeutics using this organ chip. So in this influenza model, we did a RNA, a siRNA screen to look for um, gene targets that might mediate host response to viral infection, protect against it. And we found a number that worked and, but when we tested other siRNAs, they didn't work. And we realized serendipitously that all these RNAs that worked had a novel structure, tertiary structure, that they were short double-stranded RNAs. And what they turned out to be are potent immunostimulators of type one and three interferons. And here you can see 30 fold increase in our chips of interferon beta, but also alpha and lambda. I should note that lambda Alpha, protein version of interferon lambda has been shown to be therapeutic in COVID-19 in patients. Um, but this one short double strand RNA in, increases all three types of interferons. It protects against H1N1 influenza, H3N2 influenza on our chips. It protects against SARS-CoV-2 in vitro models, MERS in vitro models, these are in BSL-3 labs, common cold virus. So it is a, if you like, disease agnostic therapeutic. And we tested this more recently in, um, oops, sorry, in, ooh, uh, I don't know why we lost that. We tested it more recently in um, a, a mouse, COVID-19 model on the right. And as you can see here, uh, you get a five log reduction in viral load uh, in these mouse. What I'm, I'm not gonna show you is that the same drug also inhibits cancer growth because interferons are important for cancer growth as well. And so it is truly a diagnostic therapeutic. Okay, that was just long. <laughs> Um, we've made many different organ chips. So this is a human intestine chip. Uh, you put the cells on. Uh, we started initially with KCO2 cells and established cell line, and you get intestinal villi forming on chips. But now we use primary uh, patient-derived organoids, which I'm sure you've all heard about, contain stem cells from biopsies. You grow them up in matrigel in a thick gel, as shown at the left. People do a lot of exciting work on the cellular basis of disease in these gels, but you don't have access to the lumen. You can't measure absorption, transport microbiome. There's no other tissue types there. So we break them up, put them in the top channel, put endothelium in the bottom and make our chips. And that's what you see from above and the side, beautiful intestinal villi on these chips. When you do transcriptomic analysis and you compare, for example, the duodenum in vivo at the right, the organoid from the duodenum at the left and the chip made with the cells from that organoid, the intestine chip is actually closer to in vivo across the whole transcriptome. We've made duodenum, ileum, jejunum chips. This is a colon chip. This is top right is a cross section through the chip showing you the incredible mimicry of what you see in vivo, basal nuclei, goblets, cell, uh, mucus and magenta, apical microvilli. You could turn it on the side and use uh, um, DIC, in a dark field imaging, and you could see this white fuzz, that's mucus. And you could actually see mucus accumulating in live cultures using this technique. And for the first time, we're able to accumulate the mucus layer of the same thickness and has the same bilayer structure as seen in human, which is very important because the 
the internal layer is the non-penetrable layer, which is how you can protect against your own microbiome and pathogens. We recently made chips with cells from patients with inflammatory bowel disease, where we have both the epithelium organoid and the stroma from these patients. We also have them from healthy patients, and we could do epithelial stromal tissue recombinants on chips. So healthy epithelium, disease stroma, vice versa. When we do this, what we find, amazingly, is that the stroma is driving most of the inflammation. So if you have a, a healthy epithelium here at the top with an IBD fibroblast stroma, you see increased permeability, increased inflammatory cytokines. With a healthy stroma, you don't see that. If you take an IBD epithelium with a healthy stroma, it's also suppressed. So um, it's not completely but the stroma, it turns out to be a major contributor to inflammatory bowel disease. Why is this important? All the drugs target the immune cells and the epithelium. Um, it's a whole new area. The other thing is we model, tried to model cancer progression on these chips and we used a carcinogen ENU. We do that, we see that the IBG chips have a much higher inflammatory response. But amazingly, we did uh, gene sequencing and we can show that the healthy chips the, the, the carcinogen didn't have any effect on DNA copy number mutation, but with these colon chips, you actually see uh, increases in DNA copy number as seen in patients. So we might be able to mod model early stages of cancer progression using these models. Now, the other side of this is the microbiome. The microbiome is one of the major paradigm shifts in medicine since I've been in the field, and um, both health and disease. And you, you, you know, people have injected microbiome into those organoids, and for 16 hours, you can see what happens, and then it, it dies. But what we did is we created a hypoxia gradient with a chamber here, where you could have oxygenated medium flow through the vascular channel, like in our body. You have hypoxia in the lumen of the epithelial channel, and you get a gradient so that you keep the human cells alive. But you can literally, and we have oxygen sensors in chip get below 0.5% oxygen in the lumen. That means you could have obligate anaerobes in the middle. You could have you know, aerobes closer to the epithelium. And using this, we could take complex human microbiome, literally stool samples. From, in the right, you're seeing it from a baby in the NICU at Children's Hospital. We collect the, the stool sample. And those are villi and the little dots, the dark fuzzy stuff are living bacteria. And you get, with healthy microbiome, you get a healthy chip. With diseased microbiome, you get a diseased chip. And we have over 200 types of bacteria from 11 different genera alive for five days in direct contact. And we have a healthy epithelium under these conditions. Now, Gates Foundation came to us and said, could you use this to model environmental enteric dysfunction, which is malnutrition in low-resource nations? And so what we did is we got organoids from kids with EED in Pakistan, and, and healthy ones and made these chips. And with malnutrition, we mimic that by using a medium that is nutrient deficient with low niacin and, and tryptophan. And what you can see here is that the with a full medium at the left, a healthy chip and a EED chip, you see these villa structures. They're very complex and you're kind of getting a little bit of grazing sections here. But with nutritional deficiency medium, minus N, minus T, you, you get villas blunting, just like in patients. Now, we were lucky that our clinical collaborators in Pakistan had transcriptomic data of the patient intestine, and we did that with these chips. And what this shows you is that, um, in, that the if we compare the... Um, basically the genes that you know go up and down it was only with the EED organoid derived chips with nutritional deficiency that most clinically most closely mimics the clinical data in the left lane. If we had uh, a healthy chip with um, with nutritional deficiency, which is the third lane, it wasn't nearly as close, nor an EED organoid chip with complete medium, or control. And so you're beginning to see the environmental contributors as well as genetic contributors and epigenetic contributors to this disease. And then more recently, this is unpublished, uh, Jeff Gordon has collected microbiome from these kids who have EED. So we've put microbiome on the chip with 
healthy organoid or EED organoid, and you can see much higher inflammation. These are all inflammatory cytokines on these chips from when they're EED cells plus the um, plus the microbiome, the bad microbiome. And at the right, you can see intestinal permeability. You have added effects when you have nutritional deficiency and the GD is the microbiome. So again, you could parse out different contributing factors to very complex disease processes. Gates then asked us to develop a vagina and cervix on a chip because they are moving live biotherapeutic products, so literally probiotics for bacterial vaginosis, which is a major cause of preterm uh, labor and prenatal, you know, basically uh, morbidity, mortality in in in, in, in in utero uh, in low resource nations. And they want a cheap way to treat that. And there's work to suggest that if you can flip a bad microbiome, which is dominated by Gardnerella vaginalis to a good microbiome that's dominated by Lactobacillus crispatus, that you might be able to protect against this. And they want a preclinical screening tool. And with microbiome, human microbiome is not mouse microbiome. So we did that. We did have primary human vaginal epithelium. Now we have stromal fibroblasts because of the need for the epithelial stromal interface for differentiation. And you get beautiful epi, you know, stratification of the vaginal epithelium. And this is just one study. But here, what, you, what I'm basically showing you is that we're using a clinical, one of the consortia that can that are supposed to flip the microbiome, and they in fact do suppress inflammation when when you have infected chip infected with Gardnerella vaginalis. You add C6, you decrease IL8, and you decrease other cytokines. So I showed you a lot, but there's other key goals the field has been challenged with. There's one is to predict responses to drugs using clinically relevant dose exposures, and by that I mean you know, pharmacokinetically relevant drug exposures, what patients see drugs change in level over time when you administer to a patient's everything in vitro, you just bathe them. Develop personalized disease models for individualized patients to create models that replicate complex immune responses, which is really where the future lies. And then to do head-on comparison with animal models. So first example is we developed a human bone marrow chip. We take CD34 cells from this is a hematopoietic progenitor cells from blood, either from blood or marrow, put them in a 3D gel, a matrix gel in one channel, and we have endothelium in the other, and we feed only from the vasco channel, like in marrow. And what you can see is, and this is fax analysis, over a month, you get near normal neutrophil and erythroid differentiation on chip. This is a game sustained show, and you get many different cell types, uh, you know, uh, uh, platelets and so forth. And then we tested this, this uh, clinically relevant dose exposures. We gave the cancer drug 5-fluorouracil um, at, at, at the same two-day infusion that patients get at IV at the same concentration of about four micromolar. Compared to, we did that on chip compared to conventional suspension cultures or a static culture. And what you can see here in the colored bar is that on chip, we get 50% inhibition in this dose range, significant inhibition where you don't see any inhibition in classic cultures where you need five days at high dose to see an effect. And at the right, you, each colored circle is a different patient-derived chip, six different patients. So you can show, see the robustness in terms of patient-to-patient -patient variability. Based on these data, AstraZeneca, the pharmaceutical company, came to us because they had a conundrum. They, they had a clinical trial going on, phase one with a new cancer drug that they saw a very peculiar regimen-specific toxicity, the same dose over two hours or two days. One gave neutropenia and anemia, the other only neutropenia. And they couldn't mimic it in an animal model. And they had the pharmacokinetics measured in these patients, which is shown in gray. Two hours very high and then drops, two days steady and then goes down. And we were able to precisely replicate that PK behavior because we have flow on chips. And when we do that, we replicate this regimen-specific toxicities. And it was not seen in suspension cultures. So this really, I think, changes the, the paradigm for drug testing. Now, we then use those chips 
to develop personalized chips. So we collaborated with uh, clinicians at Boston Children's and Dana Farber Cancer Institute to work with kids with Schwachmann Diamond syndrome who have abnormal blood cell formation. We had they had CD34 cells from these patients. We made chips at low mag. You could see there's less cellularity, less red in these chips. Quantifying it, less neutrophil, less, less erythroid, less CD34 cells. And we analyzed differentiation, looking at CD13 versus CD16. And what we noticed is that um, we saw two different, we saw basically an, an abnormality in the differentiation that had never been seen before. And we went back to eight patients that they had CD34 cells for, and we found, in fact, that there are two previously unknown subpopulations of Schwachmann Diamond syndrome patients, one that has this defect of which the two we tested were in that group and one that does not. So, you know, it really changes the way you can start thinking about, uh, you know, rare genetic disorders. In terms of immune responses, uh, we've developed what we call a human lymphoid follicle chip, where we take very simply blood apheresis collars, we collect B and T cells, put them at high density in a matrix gel in one channel. We just superfuse in the other channel. We don't even have endothelium. And we get aggregates of the B and T cells, which when we give an antigen, spontaneously organize into germinal center-like structures. They form plasma cells. If you, if you literally give a commercial flu vaccine, flu zone, you see this response and you see production of high affinity IgG against hemagglutin and antigen in that vaccine. We can measure the cytokines coming out of the vascular channel. We happen to have measurements with David Walt had measured this in patients with flu vaccinated for flu. And we've seen very similar cytokine profiles as well. And we've now yeah, done this for showing you can measure the effects of adjuvants. We've done DNA vaccines, RNA vaccines, Moderna vaccines, and it works really quite well. Even more interestingly, we're now modeling, modeling autoimmunity secondary to bacterial infection, modeling Lyme disease, where we literally infect the chip with Borrelia, the bug that causes Lyme disease, and we see potent T cell suppression which is seen in patients, and hypergamma globulinemia, including IgA, which is seen in these patients as well. And then finally, this paper came out December last year. Um, Emulate is a company I formed to commercialize this technology. I'll describe at the end. Um, they've, they, we developed liver chips years ago. They've really refined, optimized them. They have four different cell types, primary human hepatocytes, primary human, which are inside a matrix gel, primary liver sinusoidal endothelial cells, primary cuffer cells and stellate cells in the right positions. They created 870 human liver chips from three different patient donors. They tested 27 drugs that have known hepatotoxicity or are non-toxic, identified by a pharmaceutical consortium, IQ consortium, in a publication saying that we know the results in animals, we know the results in humans, we know that they're often different, if you could predict these, it would have major value for this industry. And most of the toxicities that were seen in humans were missed in the animal models. The chips were able to predict human drug-induced liver injury with 87% sensitivity and 100% specificity, which is seven to eight times better than the animal models for these drugs. And this publication also had an economic model saying that the pharmaceutical industry could save two to three billion dollars a year just replacing this one animal model. So I only showed you a bit of what we've done. We have kidney glomerulases and we have skin and we have 20 different organs that we've created. But when I first published this in 2010, 12, I had a review where I showed this figure and I said, because we have an endothelium line channel, we potentially could create an integrated human body on chips. You can imagine put an oral drug through the intestine chip, watch it be absorbed, pass to the liver chip, watch it be metabolized, see it peed out by the kidney chip. What does it do to heart? You know, is there toxicity to the bone? And we actually have done this. We don't use tubing. We use a robotic sampler to take drop to drop because it also links with, you know, pharmaceutical testing with drugs. And you could also take a drop, go from one chip to the other outlet of one to in love the other and take a drop and do mass spec for drug levels or cytokines. And we published a study where we had an instrument that kept a gut, liver, kidney, heart, lung, blood-brain barrier, brain, skin, bone marrow, and pancreas chip alive for a month 
while continuously being fluid being transferred between them with a common blood substitute. But we were funded by DARPA to do this to see if we could be able to predict drug pharmacokinetic parameters for human using an in vitro model, which could shortcut clinical trial design. So what we did here is a first pass model, the gut, liver, kidney. We have a mixing reservoir that is to be able to mimic the mixing of blood by the heart so that you could take a sample from it like you were to take a peripheral blood sample rather than looking at what comes out right after the liver, for example. So the goal is to be able to predict drug pharmacokinetic parameters like the Cmax, the maximum plasmic drug concentration, or the T1 half. And to do this using computational PKPD, phar pharmacokinetic pharmacodynamic models. And we collaborated with a company called CFDRC that has done this in human. So they knew human ma tissue masses and flow rates, and we could scale our little bitty chips to the real body. And using this approach, we published that we could quantitatively predict the clinical PK data for two different drugs. One was nicotine. We did orally, like you know, chewing tobacco or or um, uh, or, or they're they're actually being used as oral therapeutics. Um, what should be absorbed, measured its levels in the lumen in the in the vascular space. What should pass the liver chip, measure its levels in both. Same in the kidney. The other was cisplatin and IV drug. So we injected to the reservoir and. Now we could get rid of the gut chip. We put a bone marrow chip to look at pharmacodynamic effects and toxicity. The important point is shown at the right. The dotted colored lines are computational predictions from mass spec of drug levels we measured in every chamber on the chip, scaling to human with PKPD. The dots with error bars are from past clinical studies, one's from Sweden, where they used either a nicotine gum or chewing tobacco called snus three different concentrations, and we precisely mimic the PK. The other is a clinical study with cisplatin, one in three hour infusion, we precisely mimic the PK, same computational model. So this is feasible. So to pull this all together, I mean, what we have is that these two channel chips can faithfully recapitulate human pathophysiology. They mimic human responses to drugs and radiation. I didn't show you using clinically relevant dose exposures. They quantitatively predict human drug PK parameters. And, you, and we believe that they're really ready to be integrated into the drug development pipeline. I, I, I told you this is sort of, you know, synthetic biology at the cell tissue organ level. You get insight into disease mechanism, drug mechanism of action, drug mechanism of toxicity as well. And it has major implications for personalized medicine in that you can imagine, you know, as I said, making, uh, you know, a body on chip or a single chip from single patients. You could model rare genetic disorders. You could, with rare genetic disorders, it's hard to do a clinical trial because it's so rare, but you could collect cells from around the world, do a preclinical study on your chips, and then find the subpopulation and the right drug, and then do the clinical trial. You could do things that are very hard to do clinical trials on, lethal radiation, prenatal testing. Uh, you can compare men versus women, kids versus old people. Or most importantly, you could, the way most drugs are tested now, they'll do an expensive trial test, thousands of patients usually fail. Then they'll do statistic num statistical number crunching to find a genetic subpopulation that might've responded better. And then they'll do a targeted trial with that group. And if they're lucky, they get approved for a narrow application. With organ chips, you know, stem cells, iPS cells organized, you could flip it on its head and say, Let's take 50, you know, Hispanic women with uh, COPD who are ultra sensitive to viral infection, find the right drug for them, test their liver chips and kidney chips to minimize toxicity and use those 50 women for a targeted trial and get approved for an hour application. Faster, cheaper, more likely to succeed. I, I really think this is the future. Now, before I end, you know, we have... There are other models that might be, be leveraged by AI machine learning approaches. And I, I'll give you one example before I end. So I had another DARPA program called Biostasis. And the idea was basically to develop drugs that induce a state of suspended animation. It's like total sci-fi. Develop, they called it biostasis inducing therapeutics that slow biochemical activities while preserving molecular cell, tissue, organ, and organism viability. So their challenge is imagine you could have a drug that acted like lowering temperature 
if you had an injured soldier, you, instead of you know trying to chill them, or 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 if you try to transplant a heart instead of putting it on ice, you give a drug. Uh, or could you use a chemical to prevent the need for a cold chain for vaccine storage or for transporting you know T cell therapeutics? So um, there's you know there's no place to start. There's no mechanism, but we looked you know at nature you know there are known organisms like the tardigrade that can survive freezing temperatures and radiation and people have begun to study disordered proteins that mediate this there's hibernation in the alaskan ground squirrels and goes into torpor or hibernating bears um and um there's also cryopreservatives that people use and so we came at this with two approaches bottom up top down we used our molecular dynamic simulation with machine learning, starting to study molecules like in tardigrades, like cryoprotect, and how do they work? How do they stabilize molecular activities? Then we did the top-down approach with, um, with that NEMOCAD that, that uses gene network analysis, Bayesian networks, gene, 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 drug gene networks. And we started with transcriptomic data sets from Alaskan ground squirrels, hibernating bears, literally. Um, and then we integrated all kinds of assays. We have our organ chips, but we also integrated um, a tadpole assay, frog xenopus tadpole as a high throughput assay. Why tadpole? People use you know zebrafish and drosophila, but tadpoles turn out to have a much more sophisticated immune system and central nervous system than than either uh, of and then either low, lower organisms. And you can also do high throughput work. You could do CRISPR. Gene editing, they're clear. Um, so to take you through with the molecular dynamic simulation approach, we found that cryoprotectants actually form structures around the outsides of molecules that literally impinge their movement, slowing biochemical activities using machine learning with chemoinformatics selection and machine learning refinement and iterating. We've, we've developed novel versions of this which actually protect against radiation toxicity in the organ chips. With the top-down model, we use these tadpoles. Uh, we can have drugs that, as you can show, to stop their swimming motion. And importantly, we have this network analysis capability that allows us to identify the potential molecular targets that mediate the effect, which allows us to now develop novel composition of model, novel drugs. But amazingly, with this approach, we now have drugs that we've taken whole pig limbs and pig hearts, and we can show in a perfusion chamber, and these perfusion chambers are being developed for clinical transport of hearts, we can slow oxygen consumption and lactate and actually improve uh, the histology and uh, decrease inflammation and extend the time that you can do transport of whole organs. And, and with the Xenopus, we developed a high throughput approach where this is a literally a microfluidic system. That's a little tadpole swimming. We call it an infinity pool, infinity tadpole. They can swim endlessly. We have electrodes and colored lights. So electrodes can measure motion, heart rate, movement, Colored lights can be used for operant conditioning and training, actually, you know, go left or right, positive shocks and so forth. And we can also do gene editing with CRISPR. And with this, we started a disease called Ritt syndrome, which is autism primarily in, in, in young girls. We can inject CRISPR into the eggs. And when we knock out one of the genes that has been implicated in the disease, MET-CP2, what you see is that control tadpoles at the right swim around the edge in a regular way. At the left, they swim in circles, which is repetitive motion seen in these kids, or they go into a seizure state that just stops moving, but it'll move again later. And that's been shown in the past to mimic seizures. So they just do these twirlies. And um, long story short on this one, we have that drug in, in the animal model that has mouse model that was used to get a drug recently approved for this syndrome, which is not very good. Our drug is much better at um, much better at reducing the severity score, and it even works after the symptoms start, which the existing drug does not. And based on 
analysis of the networks. We have a, that, that was a repurposed drug. We have a novel drug. And this is now a company called Unravel that is using uh, this computational ML, you know, machine learning network analysis with Xenopus and transcriptomics to develop drugs for many different genetic disorders, particularly cognitive disorders, but also, um, you know, NASH and other disorders, as long as you have transcriptomic data from health and disease, they can, they can do this. So to end, I mean, I think the take home message is that human organ chips are more than potential animal replacements. They're mechanistic drug discovery tools that can provide new insight into human pathophysiology, can be combined with advanced analytical approaches, including AI, enable rapid drug repurposing, accelerate discovery of novel therapeutics and vaccines, and it really, I think AI and, and these organ chips and these other sorts of novel in vitro tools represent synergistic approaches to confront major challenges in the pharmaceutical development world. And I couldn't do this without an incredibly diverse team, every discipline at the Beast Institute. As a Harvard faculty member, I have to disclose that I hold equity, sit on the boards and share the scientific boards of both emulate and unravel. So you can't believe anything I say. Um, and I invite you to our website if you want to learn more. And with that, I am uh, I'm happy to um, answer answer questions. But thank, but first, Don, thank you very, very much for a fantastic presentation and for um, inspiring us to do breakthrough research through interdisciplinarity. Andreas, you will moderate the session. Yes, uh, thank thank you very much, Professor. That was that was brilliant, and there are a lot of questions, so we'll try to uh, pick uh, one from like different uh, thematic fields, so we can have a spread. Um, so the first one from Joseph, if you would like to unmute yourself and ask your question, that was related to COVID. Not oh yeah. So I think uh, you. Thanks for your presentation. It was excellent. Um, you you uh, told us about uh, the drugs you've used uh, to check if they work in COVID nineteen, but did you test any of the drugs that actually worked uh, on human trial in human trials and see if your model actually predicted outcomes? Um, in the chips, um, we've we've tried. Uh, well, we well we did hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine. We. Um, I'm, I'm blanking out on one that had mezzo effects in human and we and we had middling effects but we, we didn't you know we don't have until recently we haven't had um or when this work was funded we only were using pseudotype virus and we collaborated with another group that was using animal models so we really relied on them they were doing the conventional drugs and the animal models which basically showed you know some similar work responses although it's interesting, the animal models, one group did mouse, one did hamster, and they get same drug, they get different results sometimes. Um, but but we didn't do that systematically. I mean, the, the funding was one year because of COVID, it was emergency, and we, and we and that wasn't what we were funded to do, so we didn't. It's a good question, though. Yeah, thanks. thanks. Thank you. Um, we also have questions from Elena. Um, hi, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I wondered whether you might be able to give us a few words about your work in cervical cells. Um, I found your microbiome um, section particularly interesting and the gene therapy work, especially for oncology in cervical cancer, I think might be quite interesting. So I yes. just want what your line yeah. of research is there. Yes, we have a cervix chip now. It's quite beautiful um, and it it puts out cervical mucus. Uh, it it you know, with both of these, we could see, you know, hormonal responses as we do cycling hormones. Um, we put microbiome on the cervix chip. You could see bad microbiome also can, affects um, the, you know, the extracellular matrix, like in women who are pregnant and breakdown of the, of the of, you know, loosening of the cervix. Um, we want to do, we're just beginning to do a human papillomavirus um, work because we we agree it would be really interesting, but um, uh, we haven't done it yet. But absolutely, I think we may have. A, I'm trying to think if we have a bioarchives on that yet. Uh, we might take a look under my name, but if not, we'll be submitting stuff soon. 
Thank you very much. Um, there are a few more practical questions. There is one from Adam, if you would like to ask a question. Hi, yeah, I was wondering about um, scaling this, like what's the cost of a single chip and what the failure rate is, and also just whether it was patented too. Well, there's, there's four of the patents, and the company is selling these um, in Europe, in Asia, in the United States, Australia, recently South Africa. Um, but they're expensive right now, but I'm hoping the price will will go down. But they're, you know, they're hundreds of dollars per chip at this point. The instrument is an automated instrument to run them, and that's currently around $90,000. It's not, like, you know, it's not like a, you know, $500,000 microscope. It, but they run 12 chips at a time. They fit in an incubator. But again, it's one of these things that the price will come down as it scales. It's still relatively new. Um, but, you know, th th you can't think of these as replacing trans wells or organoids. It's really replacing animals. And that's what, you know, you have to think of that in terms of cost. Uh, and also, what's the what's the failure rate of them? Do they all work once set up or like there's, there's an initiative process? So now that, you know, in the early days, we had a lot of failure for bubbles, but the, the emulate system is much better. The, you know, I mean, you don't have any tubing connections. It's it's plug and play. Um, it depends on the model. I mean, some of the models are incredibly robust. The intestine is extremely robust. You can imagine the lung where there's an air liquid interface is harder, but um, you know, for the for the intestine chips, you know, over 90, 95%. For the lung chips, it could vary. It, it, it depends. The real problems are, are, are the cell sourcing. Like if you have control over your own cell sourcing, like your own organoids, then you know you're great or if you do primary lung cells but if you're using commercial cells you can change a batch and all of a sudden your your success can go down to you know 50% 60% but for the most part we you know we're we're in the you know 85% and above thank you excellent and free tests uh, questions that builds on that like from a farmer's perspective if you'd like to ask a question yeah thanks uh, I, I just wanted to um, check like how is the process when when some certain pharma companies do approach you to to create these organ chips and how how long does it take to actually create one um you you now have like a, a plethora of them created but how what was the process initially so the pharma companies have never come to us to make a chip i've been funded by you know government foundations to make the chip so they came to us with questions they wanted to apply or to see whether they'd be useful, um, but the but if you're asking how long it takes when somebody says, "Hey, we want a you know a vagina chip," we never did one. I'd say six six months. Okay, okay, thank you. It depends on the cell sourcing. If you have the cells, it could, you know, four months, three four months, uh, but you know it could be nine months. I mean, it, but it's in that range months. But then. Sorry, sorry to just build up on that. Then, um, like, why haven't like any pharma companies then not partnered? Um, is it uh, is it something to do with? I almost I would say ninety percent of the big pharma have emulate instruments on their site. Others work emulate. The FDA has many instruments on their site. The bigger question is, are they using it in their pipelines or are they using it? you know, to exp to get familiar with an experiment with, and most is the latter. There is one or two companies that are really beginning to use it in a bigger way. One company is building out a whole core facility now around it. Thank you so much. Thank you. And we have a question by Laura uh, about LCT trials, if you want to ask that one. Um, hi, thank you so much for the talk. It was really, really interesting. Um, so my question is, I was kind of imagining, um, like, you know, when you have random control trials and there might be kind of ethical issues around assigning control and treatment groups for patients, because if they're in a control and they don't get the drug, then they might die yeah. or have a bad outcome. So is there a potential for chips to help to balance that issue? I, I love that idea. I No one's ever mentioned that before. And we haven't talked about that before. So I like that idea. I mean, what you and I have, you know, I have a relative who's in the trial right now. He doesn't know which group he's in. It would sure be nice to know that, like on the side, 
if you could find that they were sensitive to the drug or resistant to the drug. Um, but then it, it does affect the trial, right? Let's say you find that there's that they're resistant to the drug, then all of a sudden you realize that you have to redesign your trial and then you may need to use this to, you back to what I'm suggesting is like, use this to figure out how to, how to design the trial. Yeah. It's interesting, it's, it's an interesting idea. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much, Laura. Um, also the question by Krina, if you would like to ask it. Yes, I have a couple of questions related. So if um, the chips uh, you developed organ chips can be used also in development of digital twins for different organs. Um, and um, if you develop the chips also for other uh, diseases of the immune system. Um, we have not yet developed for other diseases of the immune system. However, you know, we have integrated immune cells into these organs. So, and we've, and, and we've begun to link this lymph node chip to other organs. So for example, we put dendritic cells into the intestine chip and they spontaneously integrate into the epithelium and put out processes. And we did polio vaccination or, you know, mucosal vaccine vaccination through the intestine chip and that worked quite nicely. Um, we have linked the gut chip to the brain, blood brain barrier chip and looking at how microbiome affects the blood brain barrier. We are talking about linking the lymph node chip to the lung and then first vaccinating it and see if you protect against viral infection. You know, I mean, you can think of doing things like that. Um, but are we, we're obviously looking at immuno-oncology types of things also. Uh, Emulate has done work with Roche with um, like immuno-oncology therapeutics and T cells in the lung, which is quite nice. So um, you can kind of do whatever you can think of if you can get the cells. That's, you know, that's the hard part. <sighs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Krina, uh, again for your question. Um, there's a question from uh, Lizora, if you would like to ask a question again about COVID. Oh, I ask it for you. Um, she's asking whether the mechanism um, is targeted more on viral load reduction or uh, symptom elevation uh, related to COVID-19. Can you, can you say that again? Um, is the mechanism targeted more on viral load reduction or symptom elevation, uh, infection-related inflammatory um, responses for COVID-19? So I showed various drugs. A certain drug worked on initial viral entry. That was, uh, you know, with the molecular dynamic simulation approach. Um, but the other drug that 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 the yeah, Zilorigan, that's on the cytokine storm. So that's on you know the the generalized inflammation and you know symptomatology and the real you know systemic toxicity mm -hmm. thank you um we have a question from ellen if you'd like to ask your question uh yes hello um so to what extent do you think that the organ chips and organize um because they're obviously interchangeably like they're very different but uh, very similar in so many ways um what extent do you think they can be used in precision medicine and not just in drug development? And how far do you think that the technology will advance uh, in the future given their current limitations? So um, for precision medicine, besides you know drug development, you heard one earlier about a clinical trials design. I mean, I think definitely clinical trials design in terms of you know what drug dosing to start with by PK prediction, but I think Laura was the one, Frayling, I see her name up there, recommended, like, how do you put patients in subgroups? Um, it, it, we are using these to collect, um, to identify biomarkers of disease. So they can be used, you know, for, for, for diagnostic applications um, because you, you basically can get markers of the earliest phases of a disease process, right? We do influenza and we collect the effluent from the blood vessel channel and we do mass spec we have markers of the earliest response with with uh with the lyme disease project we also even have therapeutic targets but getting away from therapeutics i mean i i think biomarkers of disease progression type thing definitely um uh 
I, I, it's, you know, these are good questions. I, you know, I, I think um, there's a question of whether you could do devices as well as drugs in these. Um, with the, the frog assay, you have a cognitive screen and all of a sudden, you know, you have ways of, and we're combining that with um, on another project with brain organoids from patients with bipolar disorder and looking for therapeutics that can work there. But there, out of that is coming things that regulate um, diur diurnal variation, you know, sleep. And so you might be able, again, these are therapeutics or, but, or ways to modulate sleep, but not necessarily a disease, but just you know, other conditions. Like what challenges are out there that come to mind to you or that, that when you're saying non-drug and medically related? So um, I know that, for example, they are currently, so not just used in drug development, but also to mimic uh, organs and test like um, for like developmental disorders as well. And to understand the functionality from a cellular level um, yeah. and the like the basic cellular functions and then using them uh, to or just on a, on a basic level because yeah, you can't I mean, use I, human I, tissue. Absolutely. Tissue. I mean, I, we've got insight into how intestinal villi form using these chips. So I have a review on using these as model for developmental biology, for example, like epithelial stromal interactions, like I showed you. Absolutely, you know, uh, uh, that, 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 that would be ext extremely valuable there as well. Um, yeah, I mean, it's whatever, you, you know, you can think of that involves human cells, tissues, and organs. So thank you, Alan, for your question. Um, Maurizio, if you'd like to ask you a question. Um, so Maurizio is asking um, whether can you, you can use this approach to generate data to investigate individual variability in individuals and uh, pathophysiology of diseases to increase dimensions in real world data. I, I mean, I think, yes, you know, right now they're expensive, um, but you certainly can use that to get um, population level behavior or, you know, I think this idea of like looking at, you know, differences between different genetic subgroups, like you may be able to identify genetic subpopulations that are sensitive or resistance to drugs or environmental influ influences, radiation, toxins, um, probiotics. Yeah, I mean, you may be able, be able to use that to get insight into population level responses. Um, it's not a high throughput system right now. So that's the one thing I will say. Um, there may be like you might want to use organoids to do higher throughput and then you use this really to do this insight into higher level complexity multi-tissue interactions mm -hmm. thank you um i've seen that uh daniel you had a few thoughts based on on the talk and uh, do you maybe want to uh, formulate like a question out of one of them or share it with us He was um, wondering like a few things, for example, whether BMI could be a fac factor um, with, with these things that you obviously don't have necessarily emulated on, on one of those chips or um, whether other um, things can have an influence on it. Um, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt there's things missing and this is just a model like any other model. Um, it's just relative to what we've been using before in terms of preclinical models and relative to animal models, I think it has major advantages, but it is missing things. We're missing the effects of gravity on bone. We're missing effects of you know body mass index. However, you know, you 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 may miss you're missing hormonal cycling, but you can, you know, you can try to mimic those things. You can potentially flow blood from patients through this chip for times, or you know. Like we mimic the female um, female cycle in these cervix and vagina chips, and we see cycle dependent effects that look like in vivo. So, yes, things are missing, but you can creatively think like, can we try to mimic it? And if you use the human data as your benchmark, mm -hmm. 
then you know often we've been able to to replicate these. I should note that I had a review a 2022 in Nature Review Genetics where I have an eight page long table of not only my group but all other groups doing this type of technology showing mimicry of human responses, you know, not, you know, human patient level responses. So um, the capability is really quite great. That's brilliant. Yeah, they, those chips seem, seem to be like an amazing tool. Um, thank you very much, Professor. I think we, we finished right, right there. That was a very inspiring talk and lots of questions, a lot of questions answered. Um, so thank thank you very much. My pleasure. Someone asked thank about you. thank website. you very much, Don. The website is www.vis, but it's it's spelled w y s s. dot harvard. edu. My pleasure. Someday I'll come come visit you all the way over there in Cambridge. Have fun. Thank you very much forward to it. Thank you very much for the wonderful thank lecture you. and many answers. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.